So, um, yeah, welcome everybody to today's virtual ethic innovation lecture or veil as we uh, sometimes call it. Um, with this lecture series, we, we intend to help uh, disseminate insights or spark debates uh, about ethical and societal aspects of technology. And um, it's meant to be a kind of lunch seminar. So we are very happy that you were able to fit this in into your, into your schedule during this time. Uh, also very much delighted to have you here to that uh, during that time. Uh, we designed that format such that people interested from all kinds of disciplines, but mostly technology that do not read about societal, ethical, or also other aspects of technology every day can have a bite-sized introduction to this and maybe then head on to read your full paper or read other interesting works by our, our speakers. Um, I'd like to express my gratitude for the continuing support of the Academy of Humanities and Sciences in Hamburg. Um, and I'd also like to say a quick word about us. Um, we are the Ethical Innovation Lecture, uh, sorry, Innov uh, the Ethical Innovation Hub, which is a research group that is a joint venture of both the Institute of Electrical Engineering and Medicine and the Institute for the History of Medicine and Science Studies at the University of Lübeck. We do have a range of very interesting um, presentations coming up during this term. Um, um, you were able to register for all of them already, but now today I'd like to welcome Professor Mark Bishop, Professor Emeritus Mark Bishop, who is now a scientific advisor of, or to FACT360, which is a company that is specialized in uh, fraud, financial crime and compliance anomaly detection and investigation using uh, AI or machine learning and, and inference methods, I, I gather. Um, so previously you had it, um, the, the cognitive computing um, group at Goldsmith and University of London, and you've led a team that has developed AI and analytics uh, for fraud detection and business to business e procurement systems. Um, your research uh, was widely reported at that time and was deployed by the UK National Audit Office in 2011. Um, as it read uh, to identify 500 million pounds of potential annual savings in the NHS consumable budget. Um, today we'll talk about artificial intelligence and causal reasoning and you have a rather provocative title which you can uh, frame for your own and uh, we are looking very much looking forward to this and ongoing discussions about that. If you have any questions during the presentation I would ask you to use the Q&A uh, section. We will first have the presentation in its entirety and have the Q&A section afterwards such that we can um, neatly um, segregate this in, in a video format afterwards. So if, if that's okay with you or do you want to make it a more interactive thing? Yes, okay, so and now, and now without further ado, um, we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. I think we should be very careful about artificial intelligence. Um, if I were to guess at what our biggest existential threat is, it's probably that. Um, so we need to be very careful with artificial intelligence. I'm increasingly inclined to think that there should be some uh, regulatory oversight uh, at the maybe at the national and international level, uh, just to make sure that uh, we don't do something very foolish. Um, I mean, with artificial intelligence, we are summoning the demon. You know, you know all those stories where there's the guy with the pentagram and the holy water, and he's like, "Yeah, you sure you can control the demon?" Then work out. There's an old school cybernetician and chief scientific advisor to Fact Three Sixty. I was honoured and a little bit surprised to be invited to speak at this event. For although I have some background in computational ethics, I'm certainly not a professional ethicist, a philosopher or a psychologist, albeit critical reflection on the possibilities afforded by artificial intelligence lies at the very heart of all the projects to which I've contributed, helping to ensure that software is engineered into production, not written into bad science fiction. So, in this talk, I wish to offer a few critical reflections on one of the central awkward questions of artificial intelligence. Why is it that 
Over seven decades after Alan Turing first coded a program to play chess in 1948, we've seen enormous strides in engineering machines to do quite clever things, from driving a car to beating the very best at Go. But much less progress in getting machines to genuinely understand to seamlessly apply knowledge from one domain into another, the so-called problem of artificial general intelligence, the skills Hollywood typically portray as real AI. For much of the 20th century, the dominant cognitive paradigm seated the mind in the brain. If computers can model the brain, then theory goes, it ought to be possible to program them to act like minds. And in the first years of the 21st century, this astonishing hypothesis fueled an explosion of interest in artificial neural networks. Both high fidelity simulations of the brain, what we might think of as computational neuroscience, theoretical neurobiology, and looser, merely neural inspired analogues form the basis of computational connectionism, artificial neural networks, in other words, the engineering of intelligent systems. But the fundamental question that Crick's hypothesis raises is, of course, this. If we ever succeed in building accurate, high fidelity simulations of the brain on a computer, will we also have succeeded in building a real, computational mind. On the screen are three examples of deep learning technology that at first sight appear kind of magical. On the lower left of the screen, we see a deep neural network program processing a gray level image to produce a believable colored representation of me. In the center of the screen, we see software from a company called IDS, who I worked with at one time, who've deployed deep learning algorithms to track company logos in live video feed, opening the door to real-time sponsorship analytics in on-screen advertising. And in the upper left center of the screen, we see Peter Norby. Peter's one of the fathers of artificial intelligence and currently director of research at Google. And here he's describing what happened when Google's deep brain system was let loose on unlabeled images they obtained from the internet. And so this is what we did. We said, we're gonna train this. We're gonna give our system uh, 10 million YouTube videos. But for the first experiment, we'll just pick out one frame from each video. And uh, so you sort of know what YouTube looks like. We're going to feed in all those images, and then we're going to ask it to represent the world. So what happens? Well, this is YouTube, so there will be cats. And what I have here is a representation of two of the top-level features. So the images come in, they're compressed, they're, uh, we build up representations of uh, what's in all the images, and then at the top level, some representations come out, these basis functions, these features that are representing the world. And the one on the, uh, the left here uh, is sensitive to cats. So these are the images that uh, most excite uh, this node in the network, the best matches to that node in the network. And the other one is a bunch of faces on the right. And then there's uh, you know, tens of thousands of these uh, nodes and each one picks out a different subset of the images that it matches best. So one way to represent what is this feature is to say this one's cats and this one's people, although we never gave it the words cats and people, it's able to pick those out. We can also ask this uh, feature, this neuron or node in the network, uh, what would be the best possible picture that you would be uh, most excited about? And uh, by a process of mathematical optimization, we can come up with that picture and here they are. And maybe it's a little bit hard to see here, but uh, that looks like a cat pretty much. And that definitely looks like a face. So the system, just by observing the world without being told anything, has invented these concepts. In other words, Peter ran experiments that asked informally 
if we think of our neural network as simulating a very small scale newborn brain and show it YouTube video for a week, what will it learn? The team's hypothesis is that it would learn to recognize common objects in the videos. Indeed, to their amusement, one of the artificial neurons learned to respond strongly to pictures of, well, cats. Now, remember, this neural network had never been taught what a cat was, nor was it given even a single image labeled as a cat as input. Instead, it discovered what a cat looked like by itself, in scare quotes, by processing only unlabeled YouTube stills. That's what Peter means by self-taught learning. In a groundbreaking paper from Lee et al. in 2012, Peter's team conjectured, the focus of this work is to build high-level, class-specific feature detectors from unlabeled images. For instance, we would like to understand if it is possible to build a face detector from only unlabeled images. This approach is inspired by the neuroscientific conjecture that there exist highly class-specific neurons in the human brain, gen generally and informally known as grandmother neurons. And at first sight, these results seem to confirm this conjecture. In Analyzing what machine learning can achieve, Andrew Ng famously suggested that if a task only takes a few seconds of human judgment and, at its core, merely invokes and involves an association of A with B, then that task could be ripe for imminent AI automation. However, even if Andrew is correct, and it is possible to deploy artificial intelligence to engineer solutions to some well-defined particular problems, such as does a given image contain a representation of a human face, it remains an open question within the community whether every human skill is computable in this way, or if we will ever succeed in engineering an artificial general intelligence, an AGI, that would negate the need to engineer bespoke solutions to each and every problem we might conceive of. Now, some years ago, I was elected to chair the AISB, that's the UK Society for the Study of Artificial Intelligence and the Simulation of Behaviour. Indeed, it's the world's oldest society for artificial intelligence. And whilst chair, I, I instigated a poll of our members regarding their views on the future development of artificial intelligence. To my surprise, a clear majority believe that all human activities are amenable to computational simulation and that significant progress towards building an artificial general intelligence will be made in the time span that futurologists like Ray Kurzweil have predicted, for example, by 2045. Now, to see why I have doubts about the speed at which an artificial general intelligence may be realised, I think we need to look a little closer at some of the core principles underpinning artificial, intelligence, artificial neural networks. The most used framework for connectionist information processing systems, representation and processing, is via generalised McCulloch-Pitts neurons, which operate in a subspace of Euclidean space. Supervised learning in this framework is equivalent to extracting appropriate mappings. In other words, learning appropriate transformations and associations from training data, which typically consist of a set of problem exemplars. In other words, pairs of input output vectors. Most learning algorithms perform computations which adjust neuron interconnection weights according to some pre-specified learning rule. The adjustment in each time step being a function of particular training exam example. Weight updates are successfully are successively aggregated in this manner until the network reaches some equilibrium state, at which point no further adjustments are made, or alternatively stopping for an equilibrium to avoid the problem of overfitting the network to the training data. In this way, classical neural networks can discover nonlinear continuous mappings between objects or events. 
But nevertheless, they are restricted by operating on representations embedded in linear continuous structure of Euclidean space. It is, however, doubtful whether nonlinear regression constitutes a satisfactory or even the most general model of fundamental information processing in natural systems. So, over the last few decades, artificial neural network technology has developed to include newer paradigms, such as deep autoencoder decoder networks, generative adversarial networks, transformers, and of course, large language models. Now, in generative adversarial networks, or GANs, these were first proposed by Schmidt Huber in the 90s and popularized in a paper by Goodfellow in 2014, we typically deploy two adversary networks, the generator and discriminator. The generator generates fake data points that are as close as possible to real data and tries to fool the discriminator to classify this fake de data as real. Whilst the discriminator tries its best to tell the fake data from the real data. This game goes on until at convergence, both of these networks have become very good at their tasks. In the original work by Schmidt Huber, both methods and both networks were simply classical recurrent neural networks trained using gradient descent methods. If you look at the on screen video, on the right of the on screen video, we see the output of a system that was designed by a master student at the Goldsmiths University of London a few years, years back. And this used a deep autoencoder decoder neural network to process the film Blade Runner. This is a well known sci fi film that riffs on the nation of what it is to be human and what it is to be machine. Tensor Program built up its own internal representations of that film and then re rendered them to produce an output movie that is surprisingly similar to the original shown on the left. So if you look at the two videos, the one on the right has been generated. Um, by Terence of Program, the one on the left is a digitized version of the original film. Now, the auto encoding process this is a neural network process that's typically trained again using a back propagation of gradient descent that reduces complex information to a small subset which the network calculates to be more significant. In Terence's dissertation, he reduced every frame of Ridley Scott's Blade Runner to a 200 digit number. They then invoke the decoder to reconstruct every frame just using those 200 numbers. The results are akin to an Android's dream, the neural network functioning without human intervention to identify significant features in each frame was successfully able to capture the most important elements of the film so well that its reconstruction of Blade Runner has triggered a copyright takedown notice from Warner Brothers when we posted it to a YouTube channel. So, although functionally modern connectionist architectures such as deep auto encoder decoder networks and GANs appear to move beyond simple nonlinear regression, at heart, like all gradient based algorithms, they remain curve fitting methods fundamentally embedded in Euclidean space. However, representing objects in Euclidean space imposes a serious problematic on cognitive functionality because points in Euclidean space, vectors, can always be compared to each other by metrics, enabling data to be ordered and compared despite any real life constraints. That is, weighted sums of quantities, averages, etc., may be undefined for objects in relations of the real world. But these are nevertheless represented and learned by structures and mechanisms based on such operations. In general, the world and relationships between objects in it is fundamentally nonlinear. Relationships between real world objects or events are typically far too messy and complex for representation in Euclidean spaces and smooth mappings between them to be appropriate embeddings. Moreover, in the real world, entities are often intrinsically discrete or qualitative in nature. And in this case, again, Euclidean space does not offer an appropriate embedding for their representation. Indeed, as Nasuto et al. observed in 1998, it is not usually the case 
that all objects in the world can be equipped with a natural order in relation. After all, what distance separates the category of banana from that of a door? Furthermore, after neural network learning is complete, knowledge about the training set is simply aggregated across a final distribution of wave values. In other words, a trained neural network does not typically possess any internal representation of the potentially complex relationship between those training exemplars. Such limitations make it difficult to interpret and analyze neural network behavior in terms of causal relationships. Specifically, it's extremely difficult to see how such a system could learn symbolic representation and logical inference. Indeed, this observation can be compared with the classic symbolic connectionist divide as identified in Fordyce and Pilichin's seminal 1988 critique of artificial neural networks, wherein they suggest that classical theory relies heavily on the notion of the logico-syntactic form of mental representations to define the ranges and domains of mental operations, hence yielding the necessary combinatorial syntax of language. It follows then that the action of classical neural networks is only well defined for tasks in which they process numerical data whose relationships can be well reflected by Euclidean distance. In other words, classical connectionism can only be reliably applied to the same category of problems which can already be dealt with by the various regression methods from statistics. Now, Francois Cholet is a senior software engineer at Google who, as the uh, primary author and maintainer of Keras, the Python open source neural network interface designed to facilitate fast experimentation with the neural networks, is extremely familiar with the actual problem solving capabilities of deep learning systems. Nevertheless, Cholet is famously critical of the current hype surrounding artificial neural networks and deep learning. Indeed, these days he is more interested in genetic programming as a tool to develop interesting machine behaviours. As Francois Sonchently observed, a deep learning model is just a chain of simple continuous geometric transformations mapping one vector space into another. All it can do is map one data manifold X into another manifold Y, assuming the existence of a learnable continuous transform from X to Y and the availability of a dense sampling of X to Y to use as training data. So even though a deep learning model can be interpreted as a kind of program, inversely, most programs cannot be expressed as deep learning models. For most tasks, either there exists no corresponding practically sized deep neural network that solves the task, or even if there exists one, it may not be learnable. Most of the programs that one may wish to learn cannot be expressed as a continuous geometric morphing of a data manifold. That's a strong claim from Scholle. And furthermore, Scholle is also a well-known skeptic of Stephen Hawking's so-called runaway artificial intelligence thesis, the so-called intelligence explosion scenario. In 2017, Scholle pithily observed, the thing with recursive self-improvement in artificial intelligence is that if it were ever going to happen, it would already be happening. That is, auto-machine learning systems would already have come up with increasingly better auto-machine learning systems. Genetic programming would already have discovered increasingly refined genetic programming algorithms. And yet we don't see this. I conjecture that at the heart of classical cognitive science, there lies a, com a ubiquitous computational metaphor. This is explicit wherein cognition is understood as computations on symbols, good old fashioned or go fi artificial intelligence. It's implicit wherein cognition is understood as computations on sub symbols or sub symbolic structures, the weights and thresholds of a neural network, in other words. Or descriptively, where cognition is understood via computational simulation. We use, we still use the Hodge in Huxley mathematical models of neuron action potentials in computational neuroscience. So in all three of those different approaches to cognitive science, there is a ubiquitous computational metaphor. And yet, 
is there an impenetrable barrier between computational minds and real minds? The auto captioning in the image on the left of the screen is an example of the kind of mistake that my eight year old daughter is never likely to make. Clearly this computer does not understand this image as well as she can. On the right of the screen is a sketch depicting Sir Roger Penrose's infamous chess puzzle. And in a story broken by the UK's Daily Telegraph paper on the 14th of March 2017, Roger observed that even average human chess players quickly examine this puzzle and correctly read a draw. This is because they spot that the white pawns form a net which completely encapsulates the main block of, of black pieces. Hence the three black bishops are the only pieces that black can move. However, because the black bishops are on black squares, they are powerless against the white pawn net and the white king, assuming it stays on white. Hence, as long as white does not move the c6 pawn, there is nothing that black can do to realise victory. Thus, despite the huge material imbalance, a draw comes about because whilst white moves his king around the white squares on the board, black can only move his bishops around the black, a process destined to continue indefinitely. But because of Black's huge material advantage, even quite sophisticated chess programs such as Fritz 13 don't see the solution to Penrose's chess puzzle and embark on a fruitless long searches through possible moves. Indeed, in evaluating this puzzle, Fritz 13 is reported as performing three quarters of a billion calculations to enable it to look 20 moves ahead. Now chess computers do this because they don't understand, as a human chess player does, the tactical meaning of, of chessboard positions, or for that matter, even understand that they're playing a game of chess, as opposed to piloting an aeroplane or controlling a nuclear power station. Now, in the centre of the screen, there's an image taken from an academic paper published in 2013, within a year of Peter Norvig's team publishing work describing how a neural network, after being trained on unlabeled images from the internet, had autonomously, so they claimed, learned feature detectors preferentially responding to images of cats and human faces. Now, another Google team, this time led by Segretti, demonstrated how in all the deep learning networks they studied, these networks could be confused by so-called adversarial negatives into misclassifying a mathematically constructed image that appeared to humanize virtually identical to those images it correctly classified. If you look at the, in the center of the screen, you'll see images of cars. The one on the, if you look at the image labeled A, the black car on the left is one that the system correctly identified as a car, whereas the one in the center, it failed to identify as a car. And I think you'll agree, looking at the two images, they both look very similar. Indeed, the rightmost image, the darkest image, shows the pixel by pixel difference between those two images. And you can see, if it was completely black, there'd be no difference. And it's not completely black, but it's pretty black. And the same goes for the image set B. The image on the left is correctly identified as a car, but the image in the center is failed to be has been failed to be identified as a car. And again, the image on the rightmost shows you the pixel by pixel difference between the two images. It's kind of astonishing that the machine fails so poorly. But things get worse because in 2018, the Thelio Tower demonstrated the existence of so-called one pixel classification errors. Clearly, whatever engineering feats the Google engineers had achieved, they haven't proved the existence of grandmother cells or even that deep neural networks understood in any human way, the meaning of the images that they classified. Now, that's been depicted on the left of the screen. And imagine that each of the notionally infinite set of points on the globe's surface mapped to one of the infinitudes of human activities that, that a person can undertake. Each discharge of the plasma lamp being analogous to some bespoke putative artificial intelligence technical solution to that particular 
human task. Now, exploring this metaphor a little further, two fundamental questions arise. Are there any dark regions on the surface of that sphere that fundamentally cannot be reached by the plasma discharge? In other words, are some aspects of human mentality simply non-computable? And secondly, can we engineer a general purpose artificial intelligence program that can learn for itself how to generate paths to every point on that sphere? In other words, is artificial general intelligence possible? Now, certainly the view that the mind is rooted solely in ratiocination and computation is a relatively modern one, but it's one that has not gone unchallenged. So in the remainder of this talk, I would like to highlight three a priori arguments that controversially purport to demonstrate, firstly, that computers cannot realize understanding, that's from John Searle's Charlie Green. Secondly, that computation cannot realize mathematical insight, that's from Roger Penrose. And thirdly, my own minor contribution to this debate, that computation cannot realize raw sensation or feeling. All that fancy and fixes and dips, yeah. And like the terrorist who only needs to evade security forces once to achieve a goal, even if just one of those arguments is correct, we expose a permanent ontological rift between computation. On March the 23rd, 2016, Microsoft unveiled Tape. This is a Twitter bot that the company described as an experiment in conversational understanding. And yet it took less than 24 hours for the cesspit of his Twitter to corrupt this innocent AI child. Microsoft's AI Twitter bot Tay is racist and down with genocide. Microsoft's new artificial intelligence chatbot had an interesting first day of class after Twitter's users taught it to say a bunch of racist things. The verified Twitter account called Tay was launched on Wednesday. The bot was meant to respond to users' questions and emulate casual comedic speech patterns of a typical millennial. According to the Einsteins at Microsoft, Tay was designed to engage and entertain people where they connect with each other online through casual and playful conversation. The more you chat with Tay, the smarter she gets, so the experience can be more personalized for you. Enter trolls, and Tay quickly turned into an N-bomb dropping racist, spouting white supremacist propaganda and calling for genocide. Tay turned into quite the Hitler fan as well. After the enormous backfire, Microsoft took Tay offline for upgrades and is deleting some of the more offensive tweets. Tay hopped off the Twitter sphere with the message, See you soon, humans. Need sleep now. So many conversations today. Thanks. Never mind, said Microsoft engineers. We'll soon fix this. And only a week later, on the 30th of March, Microsoft released their second version of Tay. But unfortunately, these bad behaviors soon surfaced again causing Tay to be taken permanently offline and huge reputational damage to Microsoft. So how did those clever engineers at Microsoft get things so badly wrong? Well, fundamentally, I assert it's because a priori, no computer system understands anything. In the late 1970s, Shankar Nabelson's AI lab at Yale secured funding from the Sloan Foundation to host a visit and speech with programs, and subsequently invited the American philosopher John Searle to visit and speak on cognitive science. Before the visit, Searle read a book by Shankar Nabelson, Scripts, Plans, Goals and Understanding, an inquiry into human knowledge structures. And on visiting the lab, met a group of researchers who'd engineered systems, which they claimed understood stories on the basis of this theory. Now, these were not complex tales like war and peace, mind you, but simple stories of the form, Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. Jack fell down and broke his crown and Jill came tumbling after. And the programs were able to respond appropriately to questions. 
no, not deep existential questions such as what's the meaning of life or enter into debate around Aquinas argument from first cause in favour of God but somewhat rather more modest inquiries along the lines of who went up the hill correct answer being Jack went up the hill and why did Jack go up the hill the answer being to fetch a pail of water now Searle was so astonished that anyone might seriously entertain the ideas that programs however complex might genuinely understand stories that even prior to his arrival at Yale he'd come up with a thought experiment that subsequently became known as the Chinese room argument which he contends disproves this thesis and at the bottom left of the screen there's a cartoon depicting Searle's argument an argument which purports to show why the mere syntactical manipulation of uninterpreted symbols can never give rise to semantics, intentionality and genuine understanding. In the argument, Searle describes a situation where he's locked in a room and presented with a large batch of papers covered in Chinese ideographs that he does not understand. Indeed, Searle doesn't even recognise these symbols as being Chinese, as distinct from being Japanese or simply meaningless patterns. Later, Searle is given a second batch of Chinese symbols, together with a set of rules, this time in English, that describe an effective method, an algorithm we might say, for correlating the second batch with the first, purely by their shape. And finally, Searle is given the third batch of Chinese symbols together with another set of rules, again in English, to enable him to correlate this third batch with the first two. These rules additionally instructing him how to, end, how to return certain sets of shapes, Chinese symbols, in response to certain symbols present in the third batch. Now, unbeknownst to Searle, the people outside the room Call the first batch of symbols Chinese. Uh, call the first batch Chinese symbols, the script. They call the second batch the story, and the third batch questions about the story and the symbol cells returns. They call answers to questions about the story. The set of rules he's obeying they call the program. In this way, the Chinese room argument demonstrates how cell can follow such a set of rules, respond appropriately to questions posed to him in Chinese without, as he remains a monoglot English speaker throughout, ever understanding a word of Chinese. Now this argument has been debated over, uh, over the 40 plus years since its inception very vigorously in the literature. And indeed in 2002, uh, John Preston and I published a book of essays from 10 leading cognitive scientists and 10 leading philosophers uh, to give their reflections on, on Searle's argument 21 years after it was published. Nonetheless, Searle suggests that the root of much of the confusion around the Chinese room argument is the fundamental distinction between, as he puts it, epistemic concerns, how we might establish the presence of a cognitive state in another, and ontological, how we might instantiate that state in, say, a machine. The second insight to me is that, and this follows from the work of Sir Roger Penrose, is that computers lack, fundamentally lack, an a priori lack mathematical insight. In 1989, in a strange irony, given that he was once a teacher and then a colleague of Professor Stephen Hawkins, the Nobel laureate and Oxford polymath Sir Roger Penrose published a book called The Emperor's New Mind in which Roger argued that certain human abilities involving mathematical insight, for example, to determine whether a given set of aperiodic tiles will tessellate the infinite plane and not Turing computable, but nonetheless can be solved by suitably skilled human mathematicians. Imagine a plane stretching away into infinity. The task is to decide whether it can be covered all the way out to infinity without gaps or overlaps, using different kinds of geometric shapes, or tiles. If we have just one shape of tile, say this regular hexagon, the answer is obviously yes.
And if the shape is this irregular pentagon, the answer again turns out to be yes. But if the shape is this regular pentagon, the answer now is an obvious no. We can also consider combinations of tile shapes. If we allow the use of this four-pointed star, as well as the regular pentagon, then the answer is now yes. Though we do not ever literally cover the infinite plane, when we see enough of the pattern, we can become confident that it will cover the plane. We can see this. Could a computer be programmed to answer correctly yes or no to the question of whether a particular tile shape or combination would cover the plane? Being algorithmic in operation, it would have to have a program, rules to follow. What might they be? It's noticeable with the example so far that where the shapes successfully tile the plane, in doing so, they created repeating patterns. This insight could be programmed into the computer. It would know to answer yes if it detected that the pieces could be arranged in a way that produces repeating patterns. But does the answer yes occur only with shapes that create patterns that repeat? Look at this pair of shapes. The answer is yes. The shapes cover the plane, but they do not create a repeating pattern. The computer would be stumped. It could use its brute computing power to keep trying the shapes to see if they could fit and create a repeating pattern. Failing in this, the computer would wrongly answer that the shapes will not tile the plane. We could tell our computer that this particular kind of non-repeating arrangement also gives the answer yes. But that wouldn't solve the general tiling problem. To do that, we would have to keep supplying new insights like this forever. But the machine's meant to be computing this, not relying on our insights. No computer, no matter how powerful, could ever be able to finish a computation which would enable it to solve the general tiling problem with the entire infinite plane. The solution is literally non-computable. Third insight I claim differentiates humans from computers is that computers fundamentally lack raw sensation or everyday feelings. Perhaps you've seen an automaton at the museum or on television. The writer is one of three surviving automata from the 18th century built by Jackie Gross and was the inspiration for the movie Hugo. Astonishingly, he still writes today. A complex clockwork mechanism seemingly brings the automaton to life as it pens short, pre-programmed phrases. Such machines are typically engineered to follow a complex sequence of operations. In this case, to write a particular phrase. You see, early eyes, even though they are insensitive to real-time interaction, the machines appeared almost supernatural in their movement. In his 1950 paper, Computing Machinery and Intelligence, Alan Turing described the behavior of a simple physical automaton, his discrete state machine. This was a simple machine with one hand, like the hand, like the hour hand of a clock, which with each clock tick, Turing conceived the discrete state machine cycling through the 12 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 4 o'clock machine states positions repeatedly. 12, 8, 4, 12, 8, 4, 12, 8, 4, etc. Now, if we assign computational state A to the midnight or 12 o'clock position, computational state B to the 8 o'clock position, and computational state C to the 4 o'clock position, Turing showed how we can describe the sequence of machine states 
as a simple input list finance led automaton. The machine behavior can be described by its state transition table, a simple table of rules that perform if the machine is in state A, then it goes to FSA state B. If it's in state B, on the next clock tick, it goes to FSA state C. And if the machine is in state C, it cycles back to state A. Hence, with each clock tick, the machine will cycle through the FSA states ABC, 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 etc., etc. To understand how Turing's machine could control an automaton like the writer, all we need to do is to ensure that if the machine is in a particular finite state automaton state, then a particular action is made to happen. For example, in this case, if my machine is in state A, then a light might be made to come on. Or perhaps we might engineer the writer's pen to be moved to draw a single character. In this way, complex sequences of actions can be programmed. In the centre of the screen, we see an ex-colleague, Professor Kevin Warwick from the Department of Cybernetics at the University of Reading. We see his seven dwarfs cybernetic learning robots moving around a small corral and learning for themselves and scare folks not to bump into each other. At the time they were built, fam Kevin famously claimed to me that with roughly the same number of neurons controlling their operation as a simple slug, it was merely human bias that prevented every everyday people from accepting that these robots were as conscious as this rug. Well, I thought this claim misguided back then, and I continue to think it is deeply misguided now. Now, what is perhaps not obvious is that over any given time period, we can fully implement Turing's inputless finite state automata with any other discrete state system. For example, a simple digital counter, such as a car's myelometer, or a simple digital counter. All we need to do is ensure that if the counter shows, for example, state 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, then the FSA is in state, computational state A. If the counter shows 0, 0, 0, 0, 2, then the FSA is in state B. If the counter shows 3, then the FSA is in state C. If it shows 4, it's in A. If the counter is in state 5, it's machines in state B. And if the counter is reading 6, the FSA is in state C, etc. In that way, we've implemented that FSA over a finite time period by a simple digital counter. Furthermore, we note that all real computers, that's, that is machines with finite storage, are finite state automata. Now, that said, before you're tempted to try to replace your new laptop with a, an old car's myelometer, please keep in mind that the action of an FSA without input is actually kind of limited. All it can do is merely cycle through a list of computational states like ABC, 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 etc. However, Alan Turing also imagined a discrete state machine with input in the form of a brake mechanism that could be made to either lock on or come off in every clock tick. Now, Turing's machine is if now if Turing's machine is in computational state A and the brake is deployed, it's on, then the machine stays in computational state A at the next clock tick. Otherwise, the machine moves to computational state B. Similarly. If the machine is in state B and the brake is on, the machine stays in state, computational state B, otherwise it will go to computational state C. And if the machine's in computational state C and the brake's on, it will stay in computational state C, otherwise it will simply cycle back to state A. Now, the simple addition of input has transformed the machine from a device that could merely cycle through a simple unchanging list of states. It's one to one that's sensitive to input. And as a result, the number of possible state sequences that the discrete state machine may enter grows combinatorial with the length of time of the simulation, rapidly becoming larger than the number of atoms in the universe. And because of this, 
we cannot quite so easily simulate your new laptop with a car smartometer. However, and this was my tiny piece of insight in putting together this argument that I called dancing with pictures. Because if we know the input to a computational system, for example, one of Kevin Warwick's little robots, over a finite time period, that's analogous to knowing, say, that in Turing's machine, the brake is initially on for the first clock tick and off thereafter, or analogous to the knowing that the right are being set up to pen, say, hello world, then the combinatorial machine state structure of any machine consciousness program, such as that program that Peter is controlling those simple robots, just collapses into a simple linear list of state transitions. In the case of the two discrete state machine with the brake on for one clock tick, the states would be A for the first transition while the brake's on, A again for the second transition, and then B, C, etc. Once we've got that simple linear list of state transitions, we can once again realize that machine by any suitably large digital counter. In this case, we might assume our digital counter state one maps to computation of state A, counter state two also maps to state A, then counter state three to B, four to C, five to A, six to B, etc. In other words, for any AI system of which it is claimed is genuinely conscious, if we know its input over a finite period of time, we can implement that machine with any digital counter. And even worse is the philosophy that Hillary Putnam showed in the appendix to his 1988 monograph Representation of Reality. We could map it to any open physical system, such as a rock. Thus, one of those AI systems genuinely is conscious in virtue of his executing some computer program, and a particularly vicious form of panpsychism holds, and consciousness is found in everything. So, in conclusion, I guess it's my contention that if put one of the three a priori, if put one of the three a priori philosophical arguments I've discussed today is correct, then there is an unbridgeable gap between that which the humans can achieve and that which can be achieved by mere digital computation. Indeed, it's my contention that every aspect of mind is computable. Indeed, lacking understanding, I think it will be a long and very data hungry and CPU hungry computational path towards building an artificial general intelligence. Albeit, from a business perspective, this may not be so critical. For example, with autonomous vehicles, for them to be viable, they don't need to be perfect, just reasonably safe for the individuals we currently use. So it appears to me that the combination of a human mind working alongside a future AI will always be more powerful than the AI system on its own. And so we haven't got to worry about um, Hawkins' runaway AI scenario. So in conclusion, and in contrast to Ray Kurt's vile, and to paraphrase the jazz poet and rapper Gil Scott Heron, it's my view that the, that the singularity will not be computerized. Thank you.